A lot of dams in the Amazon, uh, you have a huge area that's flooded where it, of course, kills the trees. The, the trees aren't cleared before the reservoirs are flooded. Or probably the worst case so far is the Balbina Dam that's north of Manaus, where I live, uh, which we've measured is over 3,000 square kilometers. And it is amazing. It's 155 kilometers long, and it takes a whole hour in a single-engine plane to fly from one end to the other, and another hour to fly back, just flying over these dead trees. <laughs> and uh, they're sticking out of the water. It's a very shallow reservoir. So those trees decay in the air and are releasing CO2, uh, just as they would as for going deforestation. So that's a tremendous amount of CO2, and that applies to a lot of dams in the Amazon. Uh, then there are other emissions. You have uh, methane, which is uh, released uh, from the water in the reservoir, because uh, the water in a reservoir stratifies uh, by temperature, so that you have warm water on the surface, and then between 2 and 10 meters below the surface, there's a layer where the water separates into colder water in the bottom and warmer water on the top. It's called the thermocline, this layer. And the water doesn't mix between the two. So the water on the surface is in contact with the air and has oxygen in it, and so you won't get methane being formed there. But below that layer, the water is trapped, and it doesn't, doesn't have any contact with the air. So very soon after the, after the reservoir is formed, all the oxygen is used up in that lower layer because all the leaves that are left there, all the carbon in the soil and everything, is being oxidized and first turns into CO2 until there's no more oxygen. And then after that, it ends in CH4, it's methane. And methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than, than CO2 is. Uh, the, the numbers keep changing in terms of what the, the power of methane is, but what is used in the Kyoto Protocol is from the second IPCC report, second report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which calculated that a ton of methane has the same impact on global warming as 21 tons of CO2. But this last report from the IPCC that came out in 2007 raised that up to 25 uh, tons of methane, tons of uh, CO2 equivalent. And just last year, uh, there was a, a paper published in Science that takes into account various indirect effects that weren't being considered by the IPCC that showed it was 34 times more. Uh, and actually the uncertainty goes up to over 40 times more. So uh, that increases it tremendously. You can see 34, it's, it's around 66% or something more than what it would be with just 21. Anyway, so you have a tremendous impact uh, when you release the gas as methane. And the reservoir is basically operating in what I call a methane factory. It's taking the, the CO2 out of the atmosphere and converting to methane and then releasing it back as methane. So that you have uh, plants that uh, are doing photosynthesis and they're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And then the plants die and they rot in the bottom of the reservoir and it converts it into methane, which is then released. So you're continually uh, doing this conversion which makes a contribution to CO2. If it were happening on the land, there's the plants on the land that take CO2 out of the air and then they die. But when they rot, it goes back into CO2 again. So you have the same effect. It doesn't make any net change on uh, global warming, but that's not the case with a reservoir. And what is different about a reservoir from, for example, a natural lake is that 
with a reservoir, you take the water out of the bottom. You have the turbines, which are usually close to the bottom of the reservoir. They're taking the water out. So you're taking the water from this layer that's full of methane. Uh, whereas in a natural lake, the, the water leaves through a stream that is taking water off the surface, where it's in contact with the air, and you're not taking water that's full of methane. So with a reservoir, it's like a bathtub, where you pull the plug out of the bottom, and the water goes out through the bottom. Uh, and when it does, it's, it's going to release uh, the methane that it's got in it. First of all, you have an immediate release of the pressure in the water, because at the bottom of a reservoir, uh, you have well, a tremendous amount of pressure. And the methane and, and CO2, any gas that's dissolved in the water then, will suddenly become less soluble. It will be released. So if you, if you have a bottle of Coca-Cola, for example, or any kind of soft drink, and you open it up, all of a sudden you see all those bubbles coming out. And that's CO2 gas that's coming out because you've released the pressure that was on the, the Coca-Cola when it was in the bottle. And it's the same thing that's happened, except that you have a much greater change in the pressure if you're releasing the water from the hydrant dam. So you have a tremendous amount of, of this released right below the dam. And it will continue for kilometers onward, but right below the dam is where you have this huge release. You also have a, a slower process going on where the water is warming up because at the bottom of the reservoir it's very cold and in the river below it will be warming up and that's another chemical principle that as the water warms up it holds less of, of any sort of gas so that will also be making the, more of the methane come up. Anyway, uh, those are important facts for some of the controversies that are going on in Brazil right uh, now. In other situations such as Belo Monte, Belo Monte has a very small reservoir compared to the uh, amount of water going through the river. Uh, if you only consider Belo Monte, if you consider the other dams that are also planned upstream, it's a totally different story. But if you only consider the first dam at Belo Monte, <coughs> it has a relatively small reservoir. The, the first number was 440 square kilometers, then it went to 516, and <laughs> Now it's 650, but so it keeps going up, but it's still nothing like 3,000 square kilometers of Balbina. But the problem with Belo Monte is that you have these plans for huge dams upstream. Uh, the first one, uh, the Babaquara Dam, which has been officially renamed as the Altamira Dam, is 6,140 square kilometers. So that's double Balbina uh, in one dam. Uh, and it has uh, another feature that would give it huge greenhouse gas emissions. It, first of all, you have the water. There's the, the Shingu River is, is a, a relatively large river, even though during the dry season there's very little water. But on an annual basis, there's a lot of water there. So you'll have a lot coming from the turbine. Uh, and the other thing is that you have a huge variation in the water level every year. At, at Babaquara, from the original design, it, the water level will be going up and down by 23 meters in vertical variation. And it opens up a, <coughs> a drawdown zone. That's these big mud flats that open up when the, when the water goes down. It's 3,500 square kilometers. So it's bigger than Balbina, just these mud flats uh, that are opened up every year. So that's what gives you this methane factory where you have soft vegetation, grass and weeds and things that grow in this mud flat. And then when the water comes up again, that vegetation is rooted in the ground. So it's gonna be in the bottom of the reservoir in this area that has no oxygen. So when it decays, it will be releasing methane instead of CO2. And because this is something that goes on every year, you have to keep uh, raising and lowering the water table in the reservoir 
or else uh, you won't be generating any power. There's a, the reason for having this reservoir is to store water for Bellomonte so that you can use the over 11,000 megawatts of, of uh, installed capacity there. Um, and the result is that you have a, a huge emission of, of uh, methane. Uh, in addition to the CO2 and so forth that you will have from the trees that, that were killed initially. Now, uh, this is a very important point about the plan for Bellamonte because if you read any of the official documents, it only talks about Bellamonte itself and not about these other dams upstream. The original plan called for six dams in all. And that has evolved over time to turn into four dams. That is up until June of 2008. Two of them being eliminated, the others moving to slightly different places, and changing names and so forth. They're basically flooding all of the Shingu River and part of the Iriri River, a tributary. Um, and the, the first of those would be this Baba Kwara Dam. Uh, virtually all of it in indigenous land and rainforest area. Um, so, uh, the, the environmental impact statement, for example, which is 36 volumes of around 20,000 pages, is all based on there being only one dam. Uh, the question is, is this a real scenario or no? In fact, if you take away the water that supposedly is to be released uh, through the what's called the big bend of the Shingu River. There's a hundred kilometer stretch and a big curve that will be cut off by, by this dam and it will be almost dry, not quite. Uh, but if the amount of water that is supposedly to be released even as specified by the environmental impact statement and even more if, it, if the uh, IBAMA, the Environment uh, Department's uh, conditional demands are met, then uh, there won't be any water left over for these 11,000 megawatts of capacity that is at the second powerhouse. This, this dam has two powerhouses. Uh, it's really a, a unique uh, design where uh, you have the main dam in one place and the, the electricity is being generated somewhere else. So it, it channels the water through this second reservoir and winds up at a dam at the bottom of this curve of the Shingu River where it goes off this huge cliff. It's a 92 meter drop. So you only have to build a small dam uh, to get this huge uh, drop for generating electricity. So in terms of engineering, it's a, a tremendous opportunity. Uh, but it has an incredible impacts. Um, and uh, there would be 11,000 megawatts of capacity at this, this downstream powerhouse, and the upstream one is now 233 megawatts. It used to be 181, but it's increased. Uh, and so there isn't enough water, even without this ecological flow, as it's called, to turn one single turbine at this, of these huge turbines in the 11,000 megawatts. And of course, with, with some water going through the, the other uh, powerhouse and around the, the big bend of the Shinku, there won't be any water. So that means you have 11,000 megawatts sitting there for around four months of the year, completely idle, along with the transmission lines for thousands of kilometers and so forth. And no, it doesn't make any economic sense uh, to have that. The, the, uh, the uh, turbines and uh, uh, generators and so forth are the most expensive part of, of any hydroelectric dam. Uh, 